So I'm particularly pleased that so many people are coming here today and um, I'm here really to introduce um, the chairman of the Huntington uh, Committee um, that will now present the medal. And this is um, Professor Jerry Backrock. The Huntington Medal itself is probably, we believe <laughs> that it's the most eminent um, sort of the, the distinction that a numismatist can get. Um, and I'm particularly pleased that Jerry is now going to introduce Arthur. Thank you. Thank you, Uta, and welcome everyone. Before formally introducing Arthur, I want to point out to you that in the case outside in the hallway, there is one of the cases devoted to Archer M. Huntington, his multiple contributions, his life, and in particular, a note about the Huntington Medal, which was created in 1908, and the first of these was given to Edward Newell in 1918, and annually has been given by the ANS to a distinguished scholar in the field of numismatics each year, and Arthur is part of a very long and distinguished list of names. Secondly, you will notice that it is the Sylvia Manny Herter Memorial Lecture. This is named for her. She was a distinguished scholar and dealer. She made an anonymous gift to the society for these lectures, and it was only with her passing that the society was able to, in fact, rename it in her memory and her honor. Our speaker, this year's awardee, Arthur Houghton III, has had a remarkable career in many areas. He graduated from Harvard, did an MA at the American University in Beirut. He followed that by joining the US Department of State with assignments in Beirut, Amman, and Cairo. And in fact, it was in 1971 in Cairo that we met, but not in a numismatic way. I was doing numismatics, and he was serving the US government. Arthur then left state and, among other things, became associate curator and then curator in charge at the J. Paul Getty Museum. Mm -hmm. From there, from 1988 to 1995, he was a senior staff member at the White House Office of the National Drug Control Policy. And from 1995 to 2005, president of Arthur Houghton Associates, a Washington, D.C. consulting firm. Arthur's service to scholarly organizations is amazing. He has served on the board of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, the Cyprus American Archaeological Research Institute, the Corning Museum of Glass, the Baltimore Museum of Art, and for all of us here, he has served as a trustee and now an honorary trustee at the ANS, and he in fact was our president from 1996 to 2000. If we look at Arthur's scholarly trans, uh, contributions by going to Donum, the bibliographical research at the ANS, we will find 80 references under his name. You will be pleased to hear, I will not read them. <laughs> <laughs> he is listed as a co-author and author of numerous books and many, many articles. As indicated already by Uda, his area of specialization has been in Seleucid coinage and his first contribution, he may not like maybe to note this, is almost 50 years ago, giving you a sense of the length that he has been involved in this field. It culminates really in the publication in 2002 and 2008 of the massive corpus of Seleucid coins, which he co-authored with Oliver Hoover and, Ole, um, pardon me, uh, Oliver Hoover and Kathy Luber, and I'm very pleased to and recognize both of them have joined us here today as well. These references have revolutionized our understanding of Seleucid coinage and are basically the major fundamental references for all work. For many of us, Arthur and Seleucid coins are synonymous terms. I now welcome Arthur to the podium, first to present him with the Archer Milton, you I quizzed him, he didn't know his middle name, Huntington <laughs> Award, which is inscribed, and then to invite him to speak to us on Seleucid excursions, more questions than answers. Congratulations, Arthur. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank 
you hold this for me. I'm supposed to I'm supposed to make a small announcement first, which is that all of you were invited after this to a reception at Rock Restaurant, and the direction for that will be outside here. It's a 12-minute walk and probably a 30-minute ride by subway, so you can <laughs> take your own choice. Uh, you know, it's really wonderful to see you know, so many friends here today. It's um, uh, thrilling, in a sense, to have people like you join me in this celebration. And it is a celebration. I can barely recognize myself as Jerry <laughs> told you about me, but nevertheless, I guess I'm in there somewhere. As um, we're going to have fun this afternoon, I'm going to try to make this amusing to you all. And as I will explain, this is not going to be easy for me. <laughs> so just relax for a little bit and let's roll with what goes on. Anybody involved in scholarship knows that nothing is created in a vacuum and everything depends upon the work of other people. People who have proceeded, people who are collaterals. And I have extraordinary memories of major scholars and people I have worked with closely who are no longer with us today. I want to mention them um, from time to time. I want to uh, <coughs> mention, I want to mention Henri Serig, I want to mention Leo Mildenberg, George Lee Reader, and Otto Merkholm. With respect to Real guidance for me over a period of time, I would like to also recognize, now where is my, um, I, I need the clicker, here's the clicker, is that what I'm doing? Edward Newell. Mm. Edward Newell, who was a president of the society, Hunting Med Huntington Medalist himself, and who um, basically led this society into the 20th censorship with an extraordinary breadth of scholarship and knowledge. He was a collector, beyond belief collector, and a donor of his collection of more than 87,000 coins to the American Numismatic Society. The core collection in the area of Seleucids, in the area of Alexanders, in the area of Hellenistic kings <coughs> belonged to Newell and belongs to the society today. And we're enriched by what he did. But he was my guide. And he was my guide because at one point in my early youth, I picked up one of a little book by Newell, which couldn't be more than 40 pages. It's, this is the original one that he, he wrote, he published in 1937. I must have picked up in Boston, and I thumbed through it, and there were all these phenomenal things that were inside it. Kings and queens of uh, coins, and I, I can't describe the world that he seemed to open up in front of me. And of course, I used Newell's book, went down to a dealer in Boston and bought my first coin, which showed me that Newell actually knew what he was talking about because I held it in my hand. <laughs> Twenty years later, I found out it was fake. <laughs> <coughs> I want to talk to also to thank people here today. Um, Uta, for all the help she's given me over the many years, and I'm going to come back to you a little bit later and say a little bit more. I want to thank my wife, Peggy Fox for her love, for her support, and for her biblical patience is the only way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to thank Andrew Meadows, who is not here, uh, who is a great colleague and warm friend, and I'm sorry he couldn't be with us. I want to thank Elena. Elena, where are you? Elena. Thank you, Elena, for all that you've done to help me over the years. My many in incursions, invasions into the cabinet, and your patience as well. <laughs> And I should also thank Victor. Victor, where are you, please? Thank you, Victor. Victor, for the photographs that you've provided on your website that I have used mercilessly without asking your permission, but I thought I'd ask your forgiveness now. <laughs> um, I want to thank, in particular, two people who are here today, and I'm thrilled that they are. First, I would like to acknowledge Oliver. Don't get up yet, Oliver, but you w I'll ask you to in a moment. Um, Oliver Hoover, um, as a colleague and friend, has authored or co-authored, I have 49 articles, I count, another 30 if one counts the individual essays in Seleucid Coins, the books that we created. He's authored 10 books, co-authored another book. He's uh, authored innumerable book reviews, some I should add, quite spiky. <laughs> I, I would not want to be on the wrong side of <laughs> Oliver's pen. Um, his interests are, you know, not just in mainstream numismatics. They go to camels on coins, 
lead tokens. They go to Islamic coins in, North Ameri in circulation in North America. There's no corner of the numismatic world that Oliver hasn't looked at and often written about. We've all been enriched by what he's done. And so, Oliver, I would like to acknowledge you now wherever you are. Where are you, Oliver? Oliver. And <laughs> thank you so much for all you've done, and thank you for all the work you've done with me. I would not be here without the help that you've given me. And Catherine. Where are you, Catherine? Somewhere. There you are next to Oliver. Catherine, dear friend of... God knows how long. <laughs> years and years, wonderful years, close collegial relationship. There is, if there's anybody who likes to deal with great big numismatic subjects, you're <laughs> the one. It's Seleucid coins with me and it's Ptolemaic coins with you. And I would like to mention something here. With respect to the work in Ptolemaic coins, with Catherine is primus prima inter pares of individuals and scholars who have studied Ptolemaic coins and is publishing what the world knows to this point and should know about the Ptolemaic series which ran from the late fourth century until the death of Cleopatra in uh, what 35 BC 34 BC thank you um, so some years ago in 1991 two I received this letter from Catherine, and I'm going to quote you part of it. She was beginning to get interested in doing something on Ptolemaic coins. And she wrote, I'm about to start on um, supporting material for this work. It is reasonable to suppose, she said, that the book will appear within the next two years. <laughs> <laughs> that was 1992, Catherine. And thank God it's coming out. It's wonderful that you've done it. <laughs> Most importantly, you represent to me the finest academic of the kind that I love. You love to work with other people, and you do so consistently and unremittingly. There's, few of us have not been touched by your interest in what we do, and your collegiality in wanting to work with us has made all of our work better. I just want to say thank you for all you've done for all of us, and thank you for being here. Now, with that, I, 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 uh, I, have a, I have bad news for you. Um, this is the worst, most difficult talk I will have ever <laughs> given in my life. There are those of you, three of you, I think, in this room who know as much about the subject as I do, and at least three of you, and probably a few more, who don't know how to spell the word Seleucid <laughs> and would not want to. And somewhere in between those are those of you who are interested in coins, those of you who are interested in people who are interested in coins, but who I have to speak to, and if I can't interest you, what is the point of my being here at all? So let me try. As I say, let's try to have fun together this afternoon. If during the next 40 minutes, I should tell you, I can convey to my non-numismatic friends, those who don't know and love coins, some of the interest and indeed passion that I've felt over the years about these things, the coinages of the Seleucids, then I will have accomplished something. And maybe if I can keep you interested in what I'm saying, so much the better. You may ask how I became interested at all. And I've told you that my, this reading this book with Duell became my guide. Another reason was because I lived in the Middle East where Alexander had ruled and where his coins and those of his successors were to be found everywhere, literally in Beirut if one lived there, or had traveled to Beirut through Turkey or had visited Damascus or Amman, Jordan, all of which I did. Everywhere around you, you could find um, traces, more than traces, the material culture that Alexander the Great left behind and his successors. And they became irresistible. After all, there was Newell telling me, go out and find out more. Go out and buy one or two. See what it's like. Hold it in your hand. Get some sense of the heft and joy and delight of carrying one of these things, putting it by your bedside and waking up to it in the morning and saying, oh by God, that's 2,000 years old. Isn't it incredible? And I did. So that was part of it as well. So who are, were these people? Who are these people we're, I'm talking about this afternoon? Well, the Seleucids, 26 kings, two queens, five usurpers, one of whom was successful, two pretenders. I mean, that's a lot. 
and they existed for some significant period of time. The archaeological record, I should tell you, is still very sparse. The written sources, composed in many cases by hostile neighbors and subject peoples with their own special views, are sometimes helpful, but they're also fragmentary and at times they're conflicting. The wealth of the tablets that have been recovered is inestimable, but they go on and on and there's never quite enough to tell us everything we need to know. We have, however, in abundance the coins, and the coins offer us a window that we have not seen before. Um, they allow us to take a look at history in a way that tablets and archaeology and literature, the written record, does not do. What are these? What do they say? What do they do? Why are they important and why should we want to know? Questions. There will be a lot of questions this afternoon. How long did it take for the Seleucid state to establish its own currency? Where was that? Who made it happen? What authority established the mints, decided what money should be produced and what volume? Indeed, how was it that these things came into being and who governed the process of ownership of the monetary policy itself? And there are very important, very interesting questions that are involved here. There are so many questions I found that I can report to you that some of them have been answered, but not all. For my non-numismatic friends, let me begin by giving a little brief few terms of reference. First of all, the period that I'm talking about is from the final decade of the 4th century BC, following the death of Alexander the Great in 323 to the end of the dynasty in 64 BC. For my purposes this afternoon, I could divide it into several different periods. An initial period of enormous expansion between 313 and 230. Between 230 and 200, a period that included the loss of Asia Minor to the Romans. But the gain of Phoenicia and southern Syria. After 200, when there were irreversible losses in the east due to the Parthians and after 140 when the kingdom was challenged from without outside by Parthians, by Egyptians, by almost everybody who had designs on Syria, which is a remarkable and wonderful place to own, and by discordance and disintegration from within. This is simplified and I promise you if there's a historian, Seleucid historian in the audience, my abject apologies. I'm just trying to make it a little bit simpler for me included. If the period is one of three or four things I want, I want you to try to hold in mind. The second is issues related to monetary denominations, and I'll carry on more of this later. That is, we're dealing with a series of coins of a, of a, of a, of a, of a, of a size and value that will become clear as we go on, but I'll be dealing with different ones at different times. Principally, tetradrams, drams, obols, all in silver, and something called staters, which were worth considerably more. Third, I will occasionally refer to two different weight standards. In the second century BC, the Seleucids took control of Phoenicia, and they fell heir to a, an Egyptian weight system, or Phoenician weight system, which was different and which, where the value of coins itself was calculated in a different manner. I'll refer to these from time to time. Please don't ask me to explain in great detail. You will go to sleep if, I, if you do. <laughs> and finally, there is the kingdom itself, the geography. Now, let me see. I'm going to try this. This area stretch, stretching from west to east to from the, from essentially from the borders of, of Europe all the way over to the far reaches of Afghanistan in the northeast, 2,500 miles in breadth, in length, sprawling. As one observer put it, it is a sprawling, offcut from the carcass of Alexander the Great's conquests. It was truly vast. By the end of his life, the territories that the first Seleucid king fought for and gained encompassed an area extending west to east, 2,500 miles, marked by great mountain ranges, broad and at times nearly impassable rivers, 
and huge deserts. This is, believe me, Toto, this is not Kansas. This is a very different and difficult place. Geography shaped the extraordinary diversity of the races, languages, religions, social structures, and systems of governance of the people who uh, lived there, including, they included Anatolians, Phoenicians, Babylonians, they included Persians and Central Asian nomads. They were also of enormously different monetary traditions, ranging from fairly highly monetized groups in the, or cities and locations in the West where the Greek system had established itself already to nothing at all in the East where there was no monetary tradition at all, no coins, no way to exchange and no way to facilitate exchange or payments. <coughs> Alexander had set the stage. He drew on the enormous treasures of gold and silver seized as he swept through Babylonia and Persia in 330 BC and the Babylon Mint began to produce for him coins in gold and silver of a type that attested to the king's military might and to his right to rule, like these. And here we come to the different denominations. In the center a tetradram a dram on the further to the right and an oval further to the right, to the left, a stator. Someone is going to say, well, what are these things worth? What could they buy? What could they really do? The answer is we don't exactly know, but we know enough to suggest the following. That in the center, the dram, over time and in different areas, seems to have been equivalent to about a day's wage depending on who you were and where you were, for a professional person, possibly a soldier. And that value seemed to maintain itself for a considerable period of time. If that was the value of a dram, then a tetradram, a four dram piece, would be worth four days wage. Now let's think about this in terms of what it means to have currency in your pocket that is worth something, but you can't buy a chicken worth it's going to create a problem for you. So you do something else. You try to fraction the dram into something called an obol. This is one-sixth of a dram. But if a dram is a day's wage, it's not clear to me that an obol is going to buy you the chicken that you want. So something has to happen in between. And at that point, other things do, and I'll explain that a little bit later. The stator <coughs> is really an archive of value. This is worth at, at the, at the then a ratio of 10 to 1, gold to silver, and a stator was worth, was a little over 8 grams, a tetradram was a little over um, 16 grams. We're talking about essentially um, 20 days of labor in, in that single gold piece, which is about the size of, less than the size of a, of a, of a thumb, at least of my thumb. Babylon also issued coinage of a purely local type, I should tell you. That is, something that had, was worth, that would, worked for local circulation. I won't show you pictures of this, but just accept the fact that the mint itself had to cater to two different audiences. One was the international audience, the mercenaries, uh, the civil servants, the others, who needed to carry value back to where they originally lived and those who lived locally in the area of Babylonia itself. <clears throat> At the beginning of the third century, and I'll try to keep this in reasonable chronological order, I'll, I may move back and forth a little bit. Seleucia on the Tigris, which is, let me go back here, yeah, here. Right there. This is central Babylonia, right here. I should say, if you want to divide the Seleucid area up into five areas, it would be fairly easy to do. Asia Minor. You have northern Syria, Phoenicia and southern Syria, Mesopotamia, Babylonia, Persia, and the far reaches of, of uh, Bactria. And I'll be talking about all of these later. Seleucia and the Tigris had replaced <coughs> Babylon as the new Seleucid capital. Yeah, those are pretty coins. I'll keep those on. <laughs> um, issuing money in huge volume, while more distant eastern mints, and to a lesser extent Bactria and the Far East, fo uh, followed suit. 
There were other major third century myths that we still can't identify. This is one of them. Um, we have no idea where this mint was located except probably in northern Mesopotamia. Now at this point, my, my, my numismatic friends are shifting their seats with eagerness because they will notice the fact that the, the gold coin and the silver coin were issued from exactly the same die. It's not just the same portrait of the same individual, it's the same die that was used to strike, for e strike each. The mint master must have really either loved the portrait or decided that for reasons of economy he needed to continue to issue coins from the same die one after the other after the other. Uh, a friend I have in the audience here, Morton Anderson, who's here from Copenhagen, and I are working on a study of this entire series. It's gotten very challenging, I should tell you. In the West, new territories seized in the early 3rd century extended Seleucid sovereignty over regions with much longer traditions of coinage. It didn't matter, but the point to remember is that the, 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 the currency in use, whether it was the tetradram, or to go back, the dram or whatever, these were currencies that were in common use across a number of different areas occupied by a number of different states. As long as the as long as the value of the coin, let's use the tetradram here, was the same in each state, then it could circulate across the board. It's not unlike the euro, where there are 15 European states, including the Vatican, and Montenegro, and um, uh, uh, one other, if I, Monaco, issue coins of the same value, but with the but that are issued by each separate state and they all circulate within the European zone, currency zone. More than 70 percent, this is the kind of international currency that went around. On the left, this is a late Alexander from Miletus, an island off Asia Minor. In the center, this is a tetradram of Lysimachus, issued in, in Thrace, or actually in this case in Asia Minor. This is a tetradram of one of the Adelaide kings of Pergamon, also in Asia Minor. And all of them circulated through areas occupied by the Seleucids themselves. Of equivalent value, they could be used everywhere. Important changes occurred in the late third century. Circulating gold coins, for example, like the stator that I showed you and the octodram that I showed you, which had dwindled in number after the century's midpoint, they disappeared completely, around 240 BC or a little bit later. The reasons, this is, again, this is hypothetical, the reasons are not known. But one suspects what has happened is that gold itself was that had been spread through the kingdom after Alexander's death, had been sopped up, used, taken away, employed for other purposes, jewelry perhaps, or for religious purposes, or simply left the kingdom, leaving an increasingly shrink, an increasingly small amount of gold for use. And at some point the court, that is the king's court, had to step in and say, let's stop this. <coughs> because we want to use gold for only specific and particular purposes of a ceremonial type. Whatever the case, what we begin to see is the use of gold only for emergency or ceremonial purposes is here. Now all of you have heard of Cleopatra, the famous Egyptian queen. This is a Syrian Cleopatra, originated in Egypt, but she was sent to Syria to marry a pretender, Alexander I. And there she is on the left-hand side as a young queen, and on the right-hand side, 25 years later, she is shown with her son by another ruler. In fact, she was the wife of four rulers. She was the mother of four, seven separate kings. 
And uh, as you read the history, you realize she was really quite a formidable woman. She was a survivor. She was a murderer. Um, and she was finally poisoned by her own son, Antiochus VIII, who you see <coughs> just behind her on the right-hand side. <coughs> There's a fascinating story here about this woman that I don't think has ever been fully told. But the point to remember is that surviving in this kind of environment was not an easy task. As the amount of circulating gold dismissed, uh, d diminished, Seleucid silver production began to increase. We begin to see mints beginning to pump out increasing volumes of silver um, into the currency stream. Mints that struck limited numbers of tetradrams, for example, begin to produce them in greater volume. Um, Antioch, Sardis in the west, Seleucia in the Tigris, which you've seen in Babylonia, added significantly to the money, money supply in the Middle Kingdom. But mint to mint, the production of silver was not stable, I should tell you. That is, for example, if you have cases where we know that a mint stopped operating, perhaps for several years, then picked up again for reasons that we simply, we still don't understand. Sometimes, sometimes you can trace it to the passage of the ruler. That is, for example, at Seleucia and the Tigris, there are two or three breaks that occur as Antiochus III, <coughs> one of the earlier Seleucid rulers, passed through on his way to Bactria, then passed back through, <coughs> which then began the process of generating more funds. <coughs> But you know, this whole business of intense and slack production is not unknown in the West. In the United States, for example, in the modern era, it, um, we struck, if you take the peace dollar as an example, nearly 51, 3 million of those at the Philadelphia Mint in 1922, 30 million in 1923, and less than 900,000 four years later. This has happened routinely. Only in the, you know, in the contemporary period, where the Fed decides how much money is needed to be provided by mint, the several mints in the United States, does the, it begin to stabilize? Phoenicia, at the mid-century, under Alexander I, that is about 152 BC, the Phoenician cities of Beirut, Sidon, Tyre, and Ptolemais, Beirut, Sidon, Tyre, Ptolemaeus, and to a certain extent, Biblis, begin striking coins um, with eagle reverses on the lightweight standard, Phoenician weight standard, of about 13 and a half, 14 grams. These are two examples. Several things to, to look at here. This is the same king in each case. The Coin above is issued in Beirut, and you can see the signature of Beirut itself. This symbol in Greek is a monogram of Laodicea, meaning Laodicea in Phoenicia. This is from Ptolemaeus, and you can see a PTO within the design of this particular um, monogram. Two other things the mints did, and I'll just mention this very briefly, is to show that they had different, they, would, they used different sim symbols to account for themselves. For example, a palm branch here, a lightning bolt down here. It all became routinized and organized in a way that we had not seen before, including to the left-hand side, dates on coins, and I'll come to that in time. As we can see, for example, this is about silver. This is all pretty simple stuff. I mean, are we having fun yet? Are we, is, it, is this all pretty clear? Good. Thank you. I'm getting some nods back in the audience there somewhere, and I'm, I'm delighted to know that, this is, this, that, you're, that you're, you're getting the entire aspect of this. But I want to tell you it gets a lot more complicated when we come to <laughs> lesser denominations. Again, the issue of how do you buy smaller things? Um, long ago, in the colonies, we had no, not su insufficient money, and we were paying for things in small denominatable objects like bullets or nails 
or buckskins or whatever it is. But the use of bronze, the use of a base metal like bronze, was different. It had been long before the Seleucids, bronze was mistrusted in the Greek world as a medium of exchange. It was detested in 5th century Athens. In some places, people were fined if they didn't accept it for pay. Silver was known, understandable, had an intrinsic value, and a worth that took its value from its weight. The result was that in mainland Greece and elsewhere, very small silver, including fractions of drams and fractions of obols, even fractions of obols weighing less than a gram, had to serve as a vehicle for low-level transactions. Imagine, for example, in the current world, taking for a dime, for example, and then sectioning it into six pieces, and then dividing that by four, and then dividing that by two, and you get something about the size of some of the circulating currency in silver that was supposed to be intended to ensure that small low-level transactions could play, take place. You can get the sense of how awkward and difficult this must have been. Bronze, actually, we begin to see in the Seleucid world relatively early on. In late, in the, not in the late 4th century so much, at Babylon, which produced almost no bronze at all during the period of the first Seleucid ruler, but later on at Seleucia and the Tigris, and at Antioch, and at Sardis, where bronze begins to be used at routinely uh, for, daily, um, for daily transactions. Occasionally, bronze was used for military uh, uh, types. For example, this is clearly a military coinage, where you have a shield on one side and an elephant on the other, that's a countermark above that we use to validate or perhaps revalidate uh, the coin. And this was struck under Antiochus the, uh, the first at Antioch. We have bronze that was used with, um, uh, 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 at regular mints for the Seleucid army uh, uh, as well. And Toward the end of the third century, with the fall of Asia Minor to the Romans, we begin to see intensified bronze production at major mints inside Syria itself, including Antioch, like this small issue, which probably is, is smaller than the, my, my small fingernail, but it circulated widely. It must have been broadly used for very small transactions. At least the idea was that somehow you could have something that could allow low-level transaction that silver was totally, um, and it, it is simply impossible to use for. Mm. A problem that persisted throughout the Seleucid Kingdom and across the early, nearly 250 years of Seleucid rule was that the cities of the kingdom issued bronze currency that often differed in size, in weight, appearance, and sometimes, one presumes, value. There is no ability of somebody who, who lived in one city to take whatever the bronze currency that was usable there and use it in another city unless there had been some, co some coordination between the two, which was rarely the case. At times, one can see the state that is the central state struggling to bring order out of chaos, to find some way to allow bronze to be used as a common currency in the same manner as existed for silver. This is an example. The Antioch Mint issued a set of so-called Egyptianizing bronzes, and you can imagine why. This, this is an Isis figure here. This is an Atef crown here. This is a figure of a Serapis or a Zeus Serapis, the higher, the larger denomination of Zeus himself, and then there is Antiochus the fourth below in the smaller denomination. In the view of one of my mentor scholars, George Lerida, this could be clearly related to circulating silver with the highest denomination to be valued as a silver obol. Remember the smallest one that I showed you earlier on. 
one sixth of a dram, and the lowest one, one eighth, one eighth of that, or a chalcus. New word for you, but chalcus is a lowest, low denomination of value in the Attic system, the at equivalent to one forty eighth of a dram. Now we're beginning to get usable currency. But there are problems with these. One is that calculating that a dram equal a day's wage, the lowest denomination would have had a purchasing value somewhere between two and four dollars. Still not very useful. Another is that the bronze chalcus, as such as it is, is almost three times the weight of chalcoy that were issued at Seleucia on the Tigris in, in Babylonia. This is this is a single chalcus, this is a double with the beta, this is alpha, beta, delta, this is a fourth chalcus piece. To illustrate an attempt to systematize coinage in bronze at another mint. But the value of these, that is the, the weight of bronze of these coins, this chalcus is about one third of that, of the one that you just saw that was struck at Antioch before that, down at the lower left. So there are problems. And one problem is that a, if you calculate that a bronze, that a dram equal to day's weighs, the lowest denomination would have had a purchasing value of somewhere between two and four dollars. We've talked about that before. At other mints, we have these marked chalcoy. What's going on? Was bronze issued at one mint, Antioch, then revalued at another? Would the court at Antioch really want to create that kind of chaos? Um, one might suggest we're in fact not dealing, and this is my personal view at the moment, I haven't studied this thoroughly, but my judgment is that we're dealing with two regional currencies that are using different systems of value, different weights of bronze, in order to establish a currency that's usable within that area itself. Whatever happened, neither of these experiments seemed to work very well, because within a relatively few years we see them ended. There are other attempts to systematize currency. For example, these two coins were circulated in both the Syrian north and southern Syria, at Antioch and in the region around Antioch, as well as in the south at Ptolemais um, in, the south, in, in the southern areas. But they too didn't last very long. In time, they wrinkled out and um, they were not followed consistently, they were not picked up or reflected out of the cities. In short, they were not, as we would term them, successful opportunities to create a universal or a universally usable system of bronze, city to city. Let's talk a little bit about visual messages. Um, from the very beginning, Seleucid money carried visual message intended to support the power and, excuse me, and legitimacy of the reigning monarch, coin types alluded to the mythological origins and association of the Seleucids. Antioch, Antiochus III, is here shown as Apollo. This is the king, but here he is dressed up with a laurel leaf surrounding his head as Apollo. Apollo being one of the mythical founders of the Seleucid dynasty, Apollo being the person who, let me see, conferred upon Seleucus the first, the mother of Seleucus the first, a, a ring as a, as a, as a kind of, um, as a way of signifying that the gods themselves favored this particular man in this particular dynasty. The victories of the Seleucids were also celebrated visually. On the left-hand side, a deified ruler, Seleucus I, perhaps. The horns are an aspect of deification. And on the right, a trophy being crowned by a Nike. This is a clearly military type, with a, <coughs> with a horned and helmeted head in the obverse, and with a, with a Nike trophy reverse, 
with the wreath, an issue of the Mid of Susa about 300 BC that circulated exclusively in the Eastern satrapies, and also issues of coins indicating military might. Isn't this a wonderful image of a war horse, horns? Mm -hmm. The horns itself, an indicator of either deification or the attributes of, of God, of the attributes of a God <coughs> conferred upon the principal here, the horse, the elephant, and we have lots of examples of horned elephants running around as well. Sometimes they are shown with the ruler, with horns. This is a, a lovely bronze of Seleucus II, with little horns sticking out of his head on the left-hand side. And the ruler on a horse crushing the enemy. I'm told by my friend Oliver Hoover that we know who the enemy is, because you can tell that the shield is that of a Galatian warrior. Thank you, Oliver. <laughs> Other messages. Here's a nice image of, of a late Seleucid king, Alexander II, dressed up in the headdress of a lion. Alice, Alexander the Great dressed himself up in order to emulate Heracles. And of course, then, we have the anchor, the famous anchor, that you can see here on the left-hand side to the left of the coin, and above the elephants on the right. From late in the reign of Seleucus I, when the narrative about a signet ring with an anchor on it that had been passed to his mother by Apollo and a mysterious birthmark in the shape of an anchor had taken hold as royal mythology. Now, these visual messages are interesting, but where were the written ones? Where are the ones that tell us what's going on? in some epigraphic manner. Despite the plethora of all these allegorical images, the Seleucid court was slow to add written messages. A Babylonian cylinder seal calls Antiochus I, who died in 261, great king, mighty king, king of lands, king of the world. But none of this appears on his coins. It was not until the 170s early in the reign of Antiochus IV, that the repertoire of visual messages was su supplemented by the appearance of both imagery and epithets that supported the, ruler, the importance of the ruler. Here, for example, is Antiochus IV as Helios, with the rays of the sun coming off his head. And here, this is where it gets really interesting, we have Antiochus IV, the same ruler, at the top, telling you he is Theos, God, Theos Epiphanus, God manifest, or Theos Epiphanus Nikephoros, God manifest and a victor. He really wants you to know something about him. And that continued to go on during the course of the Seleucid period, but irregularly. Almost all Antiochus' successors continued the practice of adding epithets to their coins. Generally in the West, Eastern mints didn't do so to the same degree. Epithets are generally absent from silver and bronze of the Phoenician cities. However, there are exceptions. Oh, I should tell you about this fellow. This is, um, this is Demetrius the uh, third at Seleucia on the Tigris, and he's calling himself a mother-loving benefactor, nobly victorious ruler. And then we, to get even more ridiculous, um, here is a successor king, Antioch, Antiochus the twelfth. Judicious bombast, Dionysus manifest, father loving, nobly victorious. This coin, I should add, is um, about the size of my thumb also. Later Seleucid mints remained substantially disparate in their use of symbols. Large mints, um, 
of Antioch and Seleucia continued to follow their earlier practice of applying symbols to their own silver. By the way, how can you not be impressed if you're a young collector of coins mm -hmm. and you have this in your hand and you're, you know that you're dealing with the money of heroes and gods? I mean, I was impressed. <laughs> Cilician mints, some mints, more or less regularly added symbols to represent mint cities on their, on their coins. But some, for example, like these two, on the left, Malus, and on the right, Tarsus, used reverse types of a specific and immediately identifiable local character. On the left-hand side, you may recognize the figure of the cult figure of Athena. We know she's a cult figure because she's standing on a basis. Her arms are outstretched, not like that, but really, this is the perspective that was intended. Arms out to you. And here is Antiochus Manifest, Dionysus Manifest, again. On the right-hand side, this interesting coin that shows a, a cult figure with an axe on top of a horned and winged lion griffin, a complex figure using both Mesopotamian and Anatolian uh, iconography inside an altar. Relatively brief coinages of Seleucid Phoenicia, for their part, were distinguished by the appearance of symbols beneath their reverse eagles, their the reverse eagles' feet, as here. And this is a coin of Tyre, and this is the ram of a war vessel. And um, in parts of, uh, of, of uh, the Seleucid South, where they appear in virtually all Seleucid silver and much bronze after the midpoint of the second century. Letters and monograms were used also, which I'll pass this one by. I'm really trying to make this simple for you all. <laughs> dates. This is an innovation. We've really never seen the use of dates systematically applied, but they begin to apply in Seleucid coins. The practice of pitching, affixing dates in coins prevailed in Ptolemaic Phoenicia, however, and was adopted by this king, Antiochus III, when he seized those territories in 198. The mint of Tyre, which is this a coin of, began issuing bronzes showing the exact date of production. This is, in Greek lit, is the year 119 after the beginning of the Seleucid dynasty in 313 or 194 BC. That's the date itself there. We first begin to see dates at Tyre, and then it begins to spread to Seleucid coinages of Phoenicia, and then is picked up at a later point at other mints like at the capital city of Antioch. In a departure, we have a usurper, Tryphon, who, because he had overthrown the Seleucid dynasty, began to mark his coins with the dates of his own reign. This one is marked year four, Delta, or year four of his own reign at, at, uh, at Ptolemaeus. That was probably only months before he was captured and killed, but nevertheless, it was a noble attempt. He was a contemporary Douglas MacArthur, a military commander who simply seized control. The Seleucid dynasty struck no later dated silver but continued to issue dated bronzes into the early second century. In a departure from the practice of royal bronzes with principally dynastic types, the Antioch Mint began in 169 to issue... Oh, good heavens. I missed something entirely. This is one of those wonderful moments of, in Phoenicia where two competing cities decided to issue, though for those of you who can read Phoenician, you can all <laughs> hold your hands up if you'd like to. Let me tell you what, what they, these two bronze coins say.
On the top, the small bronze issue proclaims us to be of the Sidonians, metropolis of Cambe, Hipponi, Citium, and Tyre. The coin below announces itself to be the city of Tyre, metropolis of the Sidonians. <laughs> this kind of thing must have gone on quite frequently, but this is the only uh, circumstance where, that I know of where we have inscriptions, competing inscriptions um, in coins themselves. I had to walk through this a little bit more quickly because I have a bunch of other things I'd like to take up. <laughs> the late Seleucid Kingdom, by the time we get to this period, which is about the 120s, um, actually 110, uh, the turn of the century, this, the, the, the kingdom itself has collapsed to this area, and almost entirely given to these small cities in the area of Phoenicia and to the north. Everything to the east has been lost. The Parthians control this, the Romans control everything to the north of the Taurus range, and Egypt in the south runs Egypt itself. The Seleucid Kingdom had been reduced territorially to a few major cities. Here, six mints issued silver coinage, and that number soon fell to five. Of these only Antioch and Damascus, Antioch to the north and Damascus in the interior, issued silver money in any volume. And by the end of the dynasty, only one mint, Antioch, continued to function before Seleucid authority was totally extinguished. Proceeding onward to sort of as an illustration of some of the events that were going on, when you take a look at what was happening with the value of the coins themselves, that is the value of silver within each coin, you begin to see a drop in the weight of the coin itself from what, this is a very simplified chart, from somewhere around 17 grams down to about 16.7 and down finally toward the end um, to where are we now? We must be in the middle 15, 15, 15, 30 or 15, 40. Grams. This is a dram dramatic weight change. What was going on was that the kingdom was robbing itself. In order to pay for the requirements of the kingdom, the central authority was beginning to leach down to draw from the silver tetradram time after time, decade after decade, enough money to be able to, to create more. And the consequences, as I will show you, was disastrous. Let me just, the Seleucid, one of the, the decline in weight standard and the debasement of Seleucid silver, because we watched the Seleucid silver fineness reduced at the same time. It's not hard to understand. As Seleucid rulers found themselves increasingly pressed for funds to finance military and other requirements of the court, they began to look to money circulating in their territories as a way to add to their treasuries. They, financial authorities probably thought the small weight reductions would do no harm, but after a while this begins to carry on, and you, it's irreversible. You'll never be able to go back once you go down that course. The most important uh, consequence of, of this was that in time the Seleucid monetary system slowly closed. I pointed out to you before where there were coinage of other countries, of other states, that were circulating within Seleucid territory. After a while, we no longer see these. The hordes that we find at the end of the second century, around 100 or a little bit later, become absolutely void of anything other than Seleucid currency. As newly struck lower value coins were produced, earlier Seleucid and foreign coins began to disappear. They were melted down, or they were recoined, or and they were recoined. And in their place, Seleucid silver money circulating in Seleucid territory became increasingly and finally, overwhelmingly, made up entirely of coins of recent issue. By the last decades of the second century, Syrian tetradrams produced on the reduced attic st uh, standard were only those circulating in the Seleucid state in the neighboring states around him, 
By the way, this is Oliver Hoover's slide. I want to tell you, we talked long and hard about how to make it colorful and pretty. In time, what you had was only one area of Seleucid control where the attic weight standard was in effect. Different standards at different cities at this exactly the same time. The economies of each closed in on each other and the number of trading partners, trading cities was reduced to, um, to only a handful in each particular case. We're looking at the end of the kingdom. Modern states with territories generally agreed by international conventions rise and decline in power according to the strength of their economies and their ability to project political and military influence. But by the beginning of the first century BC, the last Seleucid king, Antiochus XIII, had emptied his treasury, had no political or military influence, and ruled principally within the city boundaries of Antioch itself, one city only. It was foreseeable that the true masters of Syria, um, the Roman general Pompey, would throw up his hands at some point and throw him out in the street, and did. Well, this is the end of Seleucid rule, but not the Seleucids, I should add. Um, uh, in 175 AD, uh, 300 years later, is that right? 200 years later, Avidius Cassius, a Roman general and distant descendant of a late Seleucid ruler, learned of the death of the emperor, Marcus Aurelius. And being of decisive character, Avidius declared himself the new emperor. The news was incorrect. <laughs> Avidius' dream of empire evaporated. Three months and six days after nominating himself as supreme leader, he was killed and his head was sent to Marcus Aurelius, who, to add insult to injury, refused to look at it. <laughs> now, this is the end of my Sylvia Banner Herter lecture, but it's not the end of what I would like to talk about today. Um, it's really a joy to have a chance to talk to all of you, but I'd like to spend a moment or two talking to my not only my numismatic friends, but my friends in the American Numismatic Society, some number of who are on the board of the society and govern its future. Why are, who are we really, we should ask ourselves. I would like to sort of go back to Edward Newell. What are we doing here? Newell would know where we have come from. He was as much of a part of our society as we are today collector, curator, scholar, author, Huntington medalist, donor of thousands of coins to the society, and somebody who never overlooked the, uh, overlooked the opportunity to buy and understand and to explain. Newell would have applauded what the society has become. And I'd like to take a moment here and say, give a special note of thanks to Uter, because what the society is today and what has become over the past 20 years has been due not entirely, because there's so much that's preceded it, but, but magnificently and substantially because of your, the efforts that you have put into this. I could go through lists of them, but let me just enumerate a few. One of which was the professionalization of the staff, which was a problem at the very beginning of your arrival. I remember that. Two was the move of the society from a difficult location at 155th Street, downtown and now here, and most importantly is today and the future, the projection of the society into the digital universe that all of us recognize is where academics is now going. In terms of the publication of material, of any publication at all, as well as the, um, the online publication of the holdings of the society itself. Um, there is nowhere in the world it is there a numismatic publishing house as prolific as ours. And this is due to you and Andy Meadows to a great extent and will be Andrew Reinhardt's over time. Um, but the digitization of the collection and the enticement that we offer, the leadership that we offer for other collections in Berlin and London and Paris and gosh knows where, we're pushing them in this direction as well. And really, you are so much to be thanked for this and I do so here. But I think Renewal would not have applauded um, 
what we've done to ourselves with respect to the society's charter and our mission. Newell would not have understood why the society has adopted a policy that ties the society to the export rules of other countries. One that is so tightly written as to prevent the exhibition of numismatic material that is already in the society's own collection, including most of the coins that he himself has donated to the society. That has the a policy that has the effect of delegitimizing coins that are legally bought and sold within the United States, including those held by collector friends, even members of the board, who might want to donate them to the society, and a policy that subjects to disciplinary action members of its own board, among others, who are suspected of not being in compliance with the acquisition policy. What's going on? He would have asked himself. He would argue, Newell would argue, that the current policy should be changed. Now, he would argue that not to do so would cause great harm to the society and make it go derelict into the future, but he would offer a solution. Like me, Newell would not want to leave you hanging and say, just do it. He said, let me show you the way, and I do. Do what other museums do and do no worse. Do your due diligence. Make certain that you know exactly what you're getting is not illegitimate and has nothing illegal attached to it. That's the due diligence issue. Two, and I know you do this, but two, then notoriously advertise what you have in the collection. And you're doing that now. Everything that is acquired should be put online and made visible and notoriously advertised. And if there's a claim of any kind, for gosh sakes, say sure, we'll answer it right away. Show us the evidence. If it's a valid claim, we'll be happy to oblige. Three simple rules, and those are the rules that my own Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore follows and increasing other museums around the country are following. These are simple principles, Newell would argue, that museums follow, and it's not too much to ask that our society do the same. Change the policy, he would say, and change the policy now, he would say. For heaven's sake, uh, let's not ask ourselves what, um, what other board members do. Let's be comfortable with ourselves and move into the future directly and with a collection that continues to allow itself to acquire le legally and legitimately. I think I've probably said enough here. I'm having Uta smile at me too much down here. <laughs> and um, so I'd like to end, I guess, basically by saying, <laughs> is John Adams here today? John is not here today, but nevertheless, I, I will miss John. John was the Huntington Medalist of last year, he concluded his talk at that time by saying something quite direct. He said, you know, in the end, my inkwell is not dry, and you've not heard the last of John Adams. <laughs> and I would have to say, my inkwell is surely not dry, and you've not heard the last from Arthur Houghton. Thank you all for coming. Are you willing to answer some questions? No. Uh, well, I, I, I will answer questions. <laughs> Here's, here's the deal. I, I'm happy to answer questions, but the problem is that because of the diversity of the audience, I think a question from one individual on any aspect of what I've talked to you about may not have much resonance with many of the rest of you, and I'd like to spare you that, <laughs> as I've tried to spare you some of the more interesting things. That I've been told very clearly that I should not show you graphs or charts of dye studies and, uh, um, and, um, and, 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 and coinage frequencies and so forth. I can't understand why, <laughs> but I did it. And I think probably a, the best of judgment is uh, not to do that here today. Thank you so much again for coming. And Arthur, uh, thank but you. However, I wish to say, if you have questions, please ask me individually at the reception to which you're all invited and, and directions to the reception are here. We may be a bit early. What time are we now? Uh, 4.30. 4.30? Well, we can wander off. It's only, it's only a 15-minute walk away, and I'm sure they're ready for us now. Okay, great.